Well, welcome everyone. It's getting to that time of year, isn't it? Next week, we have to put on our taxes. Everyone aware of that? You've already dealt with it. Jesus. Right. What's that? You've already got it back. Oh, you, you got audited. Yeah. Guys. <laughs> You've actually been properly audited. That's not a good thing. I did it properly. Anyway, it's not a good thing to, to get on the ATO's books. But um, yeah, next week, 31st of October, you need to get your taxes in. Um, unless you're a tax agent or tax accountant, I... I'm too lazy to do my own taxes, so I actually get a tax accountant to do mine, which always raises questions like, aren't you an accountant? Why are you getting a tax accountant to do your taxes? But um, I do. And I'm not, I have to say, I'm not entirely happy with what they've done so far because they missed out some paperwork from the ATO and I had to pay a substantial amount of money earlier on in the week, but you don't always get what you pay for. Um, accounting for tax. It's a pretty interesting topic at the moment, even though it does have that word tax in its name. Um, before we get into things, I suppose just give you a lay of the land of where we're going and then talk about a few things which I think are actually quite important um, to touch on, even though they're not really accounting specific issues, but I think they are quite important to be aware of because it's what's going on in the world at the moment. So what we're actually going to be looking at is not so much the choices companies get to make around tax because that's not what the accounting issue is. The accounting issue is one about how companies actually do what they do. Um, and if there's one takeaway, like I'd like to think there's more than just one takeaway to take from today, but if there's one takeaway that I really want you to take away from today is the fact that accounting profit and tax profit are two completely separate things. Um, so what you see is a company making a certain amount of profit for a certain amount of profit for tax and what they make for accounting, they're different. We missed you last week. Where's Nick? Where's Nick? Uh, he's not here. Oh, I'm feeling yeah, sad. <laughs> I know. It's, I don't know what I've done to him. Yeah, it has been. Um, so what we're going to then look at is in terms of the regulation, we'll look at accounting for current tax, how we come up with those calculations, and how we come up with what we're actually doing. And then this is where it gets a little bit more difficult. And this is one where we will definitely talk. I mean, let's part of what we're going to be doing today is talking about it, but this is one where you will need to spend time looking at it at home, absolutely, because it is conceptually, maybe not everyone thinks that, but it is conceptually, I think, quite complex, and you need time just playing around with it, just running the numbers, just getting a feel for it all. So just bear with me as we go through this. Um, but before we get to that, I had looked through... I mean, I had a whole choice of different, pa different articles I could have pulled up, but I just want to bring up a couple of articles just to give you an idea of some of the things which are going on at the moment. So a recent report um, by the Tax Justice Network, and actually one of our, um, one of our academics down in accounting actually is part of this Tax, ju tax Justice Network. Um, whether or not he was involved in this particular report, but he was definitely involved in a report a couple of months back looking at Westfield and how much tax that they don't pay. Um, but one third of top Australian companies pay less than 10% tax. Um, and they argue the government's missing out at least $8 billion a year in, in income from that. Now, it's important to note that they're not saying that they're doing anything legally wrong. They're doing what they're allowed to be doing. It's all above board. Um, whether or not you feel that is the right thing that is going on, that's different. Um, but how much companies pay in tax and what they should be doing maybe two slightly different things. A second one I just want to draw your attention to, and I'll bring all of these up and I'll put these all up on our social media just so if you are interested and want to look into these in any more detail, you can do that. Um, Apple pays $193 million in tax in Australia on $27 billion worth of revenue. Um, now, you know, we're all good accountants. You know you don't get tax on revenue because obviously you, there's expenses involved there. But even if you took a really conservative number to work out what, those, um, what their profit would be based on that revenue, $193 million on tax is still not a large number. Now, this was work done from a senior lecturer over in the University of Sydney. And I just want to pull out a quote. It's not on this particular part of the, on part of the page. 
Um, if you have an iPad, this may be not nice reading. Um, so if I pay $600 for an iPad in Australia, then 550 is paid to Apple Island, and out of that 550, 220 is not taxed anywhere in the world. So for those that are doing ABC, for those that have done ABC, what we're talking about here is transfer pricing. So you've got one particular part of the organization, which is Apple Island, and they are selling iPads to Apple Australia. And this 550 is a legitimate number. He was able to get access to a whole range of information from Apple, and so was able to, to put these costings together. So when you buy an iPad here for $600, Apple Australia has been sold that at $550. So what you're effectively doing is shrinking the amount of profit that Apple Australia will recognize. Um, the, app, the iPad isn't coming through Ireland. The, the iPad is just coming straight from China. Now, it's also not cost the company $550 to make. In a business combination, what happens to that sale? What do we do with that sale? I know it's not this subject. We... Yeah, we eliminate it. It's an intercompany transaction. We're not, it's, it's within the group. From a group accounting point of view, that sale is eliminated. But from a tax point of view, the group isn't taxed. What is taxed is the individual companies. So what's, what's happening here is that Australia is actually seeing, or the Australian company or the part of Apple is actually getting charged, is actually making a much lower amount of profit. And Apple Island is going to be making a much higher amount of profit. So why would Apple do that? Lower taxes, absolutely. The tax rate in Ireland is much less than the tax rate in Australia. What's that? Cyprus is better. There's a lot of Singapore's now better, and they're actually going to start, from what I've heard. What's that? Yeah, there's lots of people finding nice little tax loophole. And I mean, you look at a lot of, if you start looking through annual reports, and you look at where some of the subsidiaries of large companies are operating, they're operating, operating out of the Bahamas, I think it's Bahamas, they're operating out of <coughs> British Virgin Islands, they're operating out of these, like, all these small countries which you think, well, why would you have a subsidiary over there? But that's where they run taxes through, um, or through profits through. Now, the additional thing about Ireland is the way that the Irish and the US tax regimes work. And I know this is getting off accounting per se, but I think it's an interesting thing to talk about, is that in Ireland, the way that it has worked to this extent, and they're looking at changing this, is that you get taxed based on where the company is managed, not where you're registered. So these, this Irish sort of part of Apple is registered in Ireland, but managed out of California. So they go, well, you're managed over in California, so we're not going to tax you in Ireland. In the US, where you get taxed is based on where you're registered, not where you're managed. So from the US perspective, the Irish company is registered in Ireland, so they're not getting taxed by the US either. So they're not getting taxed in the US, they're not getting taxed in Ireland, and it's a really nice, clever way to kind of get away from paying much tax. Um, so that is a world that we're currently living in. Google does this, you know, I'm sure most companies would try to do something like this. It is technically outside of accounting for tax, what we're about to go into, but I think it is important to think about, well, should this be the case? Because if, we're, if these companies aren't the ones paying tax and operating here, governments get, have to get money from somewhere. So why, I suppose, who is going to be paying that shortfall? So understanding tax accounting. What I want to bring up here, and I know this isn't on your slides, but I think this is setting the scene for where we're going. So we've got Woolworths here. So we've got profit before tax, tax expense, tax paid, current tax liabilities, deferred tax assets, deferred tax liabilities. Profit before tax, we all know. Profit before tax for Woolworths is about three and a half billion. The tax expense is about a billion dollars. And if you think the corporate tax rate in Australia is about 30%, a billion on three and a half is about right. The amount of tax that they pay, and this is the thing that is really important to bring from this. The tax expense is what's on the profit and loss statement. And if you ask most people, most people are kind of scared of profit and like accounting reports at all. But they think, oh, look, expense, you know, profit and loss, tax expense, they paid this much tax. And in Woolworth's case, that's about right. There's about a billion dollars in tax expense, and they pay about $100 million more than that in tax paid. They owe about 160 in current tax liabilities. 
And current tax liabilities are what you owe the government. So when you put in your tax return and they say you owe us this much and if you haven't paid it at the end of your balance, you know, financial year end, that's the number that you would put in there. So that is actually a legitimate liability that the company has. Deferred tax assets though and deferred tax liabilities, these are things that we're going to talk about later today. But they have quite a substantial deferred tax asset. Echo Entertainment Group. This is the group which runs the current casino in Sydney. So Star is run by Echo. Profit before tax of 153 million. So they were profitable from a tax perspective, yet their tax expense was negative. So just because you're making profits doesn't mean you're gonna have a tax expense being recognized. And they actually got money paid back by the government. So the government actually gave them $45 million in terms of income tax. They have no current tax liabilities, which given that they were getting money from the government, makes sense. Deferred tax assets, and they've got $180 million, million of deferred tax liabilities, which again, we'll talk about later today. But where it starts to get interesting, AMP, big company, about a billion and a half in, rev in profit. If you, if you left it at just looking at their profit and loss statement, they had close to $800 million in tax expenses on their profit and loss statement. But yet, even with that number, what they actually paid was less than 200. And what they owed was about 50. So you can see that those two numbers, what you pay and what you owe, is nothing to do with that tax expense. So just because you see a tax expense doesn't mean that that's what's actually being paid. And if you're thinking about your bonus assignment, that's one of the things that we want you to have a look at is how much tax got paid and how much tax got expensed. And they've got these huge DTAs and DTLs. Bank of Queensland, this is from last year because their 2014 isn't available. They lost money, they had a negative tax expense and they paid 150 odd million dollars in tax. The point, again, coming back to is just because you have profit doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna have a tax expense. Is there? Partly some of that may be driven, partly some of this. So the question or the, the response was, you know, is this driven by time delays? Yeah, partly it could be that, but some of it is going to be driven, not so much with Bank of Queensland, but it's what's happening with these things that we're going to be looking at. Um, so that's where we're going to be focusing on today. So the upshot of all this is what you pay, what you expense doesn't necessarily have to be the same thing. Accounting profit. Um, we're not going to be looking at accounting profit in terms of calculating and coming up with different numbers this, this week or next week. All the accounting, all the stuff we've done over the last three months has helped get you to a point where you have a much better understanding of how accounting profit is created. Um, and so that first bit, we now know in a much better sense how that accounting profit number comes out. It's that next number, the tax profit, that is something that we haven't covered in this class. Now, quick because I know different people do this at different times, but the tax subject as part of the major. Tax, what's it called? Tax law. tax law, okay. So tax law is a subject where you cover this material. Um, just quick show of hands, we don't expect people to be tax experts in here, so I'm not gonna ask you a tax question if you do. Just who has either done it or are doing tax law? Okay, so a few. So you have, Depending on when you've done it, you may have forgotten some of it. I appreciate that can happen. Um, the upshot of all this is, is that the number you get for accounting profit and the number that you get for tax profit are two different things. So they are actually calculated differently. Um, and it's not so much the timing, the timing difference with you, when you pay the people. There's actually timing differences between when the revenues and expenses are recognized from a tax point of view or from a, an accounting point of view. And what we're going to do is actually look at examples where this is the case. Um, so this is pretty important. And if, as I said earlier on, if there's one thing to really take away from this is accounting profit and taxable profit, these are two different things. Um, you may fluke it and they may be the same, but they're generally driven by slightly different ideas. Okay, which is going to throw a question out to you guys. Um, because I was a couple of, I was actually a couple of months ago, I was having a, was it a, it was after, it was a dinner at a research conference and somebody was talking about, well, shouldn't we try to harmonize tax rules and accounting rules? Because realistically, 
Accounting rules are quite complex, tax rules are quite complex, and that means it's almost a duplication. Like, we've got to have accountants doing two separate things. There's a lot of money involved. Wouldn't it just be easier if we just have one set, and that's what you do? And I think there's a lot of reasons why it ne wouldn't work. And one of those is who uses those different sets of numbers. So now that we're about three, three and a half months into this, why do we have accounting, why, financial reporting? So, you know, providing to external stakeholders annual reports and such. Why do we have accounting? What's its purpose? Think all the way back to week one. Yeah, decision making is one of the preeminent. And when you look at the regulators, that is what they see as important. Who is making decisions about these sort of things? What's the primary one that we deal with? Shareholders. Shareholders. So equity decision making, equity investors. So from an equity investor point of view, they're much more interested in knowing not things with absolute precision. They just want to have a rough sense, okay, what's this going? You know, if you know a car is going to be 35,000 or 35,500, yeah, you know, it's $500, $500 difference, but it's in the ballpark. Um, if you're going out to try to buy a house, you know, you need to have an estimate of what the house price is rather than absolute surety that this is exactly what it's going to be because it helps you make that decision. From a tax point of view, What's the purpose of tax? And that's actually quite a broad question, but what's, it's a very broad. Pay as much tax as possible. What's that, pay as much? Yes. Receive, okay. Well, you'd like to pay as much tax as possible. No, I mean. Why not, it helps, it helps society, you know, we can. No, I don't like to pay any taxes. At all? <laughs> yes. Really? Yeah. It does good things. It pays for roads and stuff. It doesn't pay other things. Yeah, that's true. Um, so what is, what's the purpose of, from a government point of view, who is interested in, in tax? The ATO. Yeah, the ATO is interested in how much you pay. So I suppose when we think about relevance for reliability, they're going to be much more interested in reliability. Do you think if you could estimate what your deductions are going to be, what do you think the ATO is going to think you're going to do with your estimates of deductions? Yeah, they're going to think you're going to push them up a bit. And certainly a lot of people try to do that, and there are ways and means of doing those things, at least on the, bound, at least on the boundaries of things. Um, one good tip I got told about when you lodge your tax return is when you're coming up with deductions, and if you have to estimate them, don't make it a round number. So if you, and even, even if it's legitimate, even if you've added everything up to the cent and it turns out to be, say, around $1,000, don't put it in $1,000 because then you'll get audited. Um, because they look... What's that? Maybe that was a thing. Because they have, they have, they will sort of use that as a red flag. I mean, you generally will estimate, if you've estimated a round number, that's probably what you do. Estimated $2,000 worth of deductions. Well, hang on. It, was it exactly, or was that just a really coincidental number that you've added everything together? So if you legitimately have 2,000, make it 1,998. Less likely to get picked up. Um, they're much more after reliability because the idea being that if people can have judgment around the amount of tax numbers that they're starting to put through, they will start to push things down a bit. Whereas, yes, there's pressure on companies to do various things, but the absolute, sometimes the absolute precision is less important. So the users and what they're trying to use these numbers for are different, which is why you have different outcomes. So accounting profit we've come across, it is based on the accrual system, and, you know, yes, there are some judgments being put in. So depreciation we know is a judgment. A lot of the things that we've looked at, long service leave, is a judgment. It's a massive judgment. Um, there are various things where we're coming up with subjective numbers to come up with these determinations. Um, but with taxable income, it's a mix. Now, it can't be completely cash-based because it just wouldn't work if that was the case. But you'll see a lot more cash-based in the tax system than you will see in the accounting system. There will be accruals. There will be things around depreciation, and we'll look at that. Um, depreciation tax rates generally are different to accounting tax rates. Um, some things are included in revenue expenses. Um, you know, I remember when, and it always, even back when he told me, I thought it was a massive G up at the time, but I remember Dad saying that he used to be able to get deductions for his suits. Um, because, you know, it was a cost of business, he had to wear a suit to business, so 
and it was whether or not it was technically allowable at the time he was able to get them back when um, <coughs> things get tightened up things change and there are things which are not allowable for deductions for tax purposes but are still business expenses so there are going to be things which are naturally different um, you may get extra deductions you may, if you're trying to sort of get people to invest in research and development, you'll see this with movies in the entertainment industry a bit. You know, when the New South Wales government tries to bring down people to, to create movies here, if it's whether it be The Matrix or whatever other movies that have happened within Sydney, they'll often give them tax, sort of relaxed tax laws or give them extra write-offs so to get people to come and get the industry to flourish down here. Um, so there are reasons why you see differences between those particular things. Um, so long service leave, we know, so this is one example and there's going to be quite a few and what's handy is on table 18.1 table we've actually, well not we, but the textbook has got a list of examples where things are done differently. So I would, might shut that door. One of that's related to the, one of that's related to all the voting. Um, so table 18.1 actually gives you examples of that and the really other nice thing and we'll come to it as we get into some of the definitions is we actually have examples within the standards about how to deal with certain, certain aspects. So you've got examples already there, you've got examples that will be with you in the exam. So long service leave, we went through that a few weeks ago. We know and say for example for me UTS has been figuring out a tax expense, so not a tax expense, figuring out a long service leave expense for me over the last 11 years. They've been slowly building that up, and it, so the liability up, so there's been a, an expense building up over those years. Now, they have not been able to claim any of that expense as a deduction, because the way the tax laws work is you only get the deduction for long service leave when I actually take it. So it stops, because we already know from the, from the calculation of long service leave, there's a huge amount of subjectivity involved in the calculation. There's figuring out how much I'm going to get paid. There's figuring out when I'm going to take it. There's figuring out the likelihood that I'm still going to be there. And we know if suddenly there's a tax sort of incentive layered in on top of that, there may be incentives to kind of push that number up a little bit. So long service leave gets accrued as an expense when it happens, but for a tax deduction, you only get the deduction when you pay it. Um, revenue in advance initially is a liability, but generally speaking, a lot of those things will be taxed when you actually get the cash, not when you actually perform the service and recognize the revenue itself. So again, there's a timing difference, and if that's something to sort of pay into attention, it's not that the absolute amount for a lot of these things will be different, but it's the timing of when they occur which is different. That's quite a busy slide. And what I want you to take, take away from this, I, you, know, you should definitely sit down and read it, but the thing I want to just pay attention to is there are differences that you must know. And so we're going to have expectations that there are things when you walk into, say, tutorials next week or when you walk into exams, there are things you absolutely have to know. And so things around long service leave, so sick leave or annual leave, warranty expenses, doubtful debts, um, how to deal with depreciation. It's an expectation that you know that stuff. Um, and I don't think that's too much to ask. But if it's something else, if it's dealing with an art research and development situation, we will give you guidance as to how the accounting, sorry, how the tax works in that particular situation. So you're not going to have to know the tax rules in, in and out. Now we get into what we actually have to do. I'm going to draw up on this a little bit. So what we have are two, join one thing, two different methods. There's a point gone. There you go. So tax payable and the tax effect. Now, in essence, these are used by small companies. Um, the tax effect method is the method that we, in this subject, for the companies that we're dealing with, have to use. So again, it's not a choice. This is just, in a, in a way, this is just a process that we were going through. Um, so it's different from the, from the previous topics. But the tax effect method, if, you, if as we come to it, is taking this 
and then adding a bit to it. So the tax, tax effect method is pretty much the tax payable plus these deferred effects, which we'll start to talk about. So we actually do both tax payable and deferred in the tax effect method, whereas tax payable, we just do the tax payable method. And what essentially we're doing here is, and again, this is just laying it out early, So the tax payable is how much we owe to the ATO. So when you put in your form on you know, e-tax or paper-based, I don't know if they still allow paper-based. I'm sure there's a way you have to do paper. You can do paper-based if you need to. Um, but when you put in your tax return in next week, because you're all going to do it on time, if you have, you've already done it. Um, when they come up and say you owe th that, that's the tax payable that we're looking at. And I know that a lot of us are using pay as you go, so we've already paid some of that, but the sum total of what you owe is gonna be the payable, and then you cash it, and then you pay it in, actually pay it, and it goes out in cash. This is, and I'll, it's kind of like the accrual, so this is almost a cash-based system in a way, and this is trying to take this number that we owe to the ATO, and then adjusting this to fit an accounting point of view. And it's this bit that we're gonna spend most of our time getting on top of the things which are in there because it is a little bit convoluted. So bearing that in mind. So the tax payable method, you take your form, you put it in. You've worked out how much your taxable income is. Let's say you work out your taxable income at $1,000. Now let's say it's a company, so we're just working on a flat 30%. Assuming that the ATO is happy with what you put in, they may not be. Sorry to keep drawing attention to it. Um, but $1,000 in taxable income, that's your taxable income. You take it by the statutory tax rate, which at this point is 30%. And you owe $300. Debit tax expense. $300, credit income tax payable, $300. Then once we paid that off, $300, credit cash. And ultimately what we've done is debit tax expense and cash. So we've recognized an expense on the profit and loss statement. We've recognized cash going out of the business because it has actually gone out of the business. And that's relatively straightforward. No, no, it won't. Um, and that's a good point. So it won't always be 30%. Now, but the assumption is at least what you guys are going to have to worry about in the next month. It'll be 30. It'll be 30. Like, unless we explicitly use another tax rate. And if, if we use another tax rate other than 30%, we will absolutely say this is a tax rate. Generally speaking, we'll make it explicit what the tax rate is. If we don't put one in, assume 30 um, but you're absolutely right. The tax rate may change. I mean, Tony Abbott has put forward, and I've no. I mean, given how the budget is not moving forward, moving forward, I don't really know. Some of it depends on Clive Palmer, which God knows what's happening there. There was a mooted 28.5% tax rate, um, so that could well change. Now, again, more impacting the day students because, as I mentioned last week, we're moving to an 8:30 a.m. lecture for the day classes next semester. Um, which is a reason not to have to come back and do it again. Um, but dealing with a 28.5% tax rate would be a pain in the proverbial. Because, um, I mean, 30%, you know, you can do that quite easily. 28.5%, I mean, that's just a painful number to have to figure out. And, you know, I'm going to have to sit down and change everything. And it's just not an easy number to deal with. So I'm hoping that's not going to actually happen. Um, <laughs> so, okay, it's not a good... It's not a... It's not a good reason not to want a lower company tax rate, admittedly, but I'm not going to say I'm not self-interested. The tax effects method. So this is, what, this is the bulk of what we need to worry about. So the tax, <coughs> excuse me, the tax expense recognized is the tax payable. So that first bit is what you owe the government. That's the very first bit. But then we then, we, but then we then, but then we adjust that number for these deferred tax effects. So we've actually worked out the tax expense. And if, I know the numbers for AMP aren't up there, but AMP had 
it was around about 700, I think 782 and, I don't know, 170 and 50 odd. So this is their expense. This is their, ex this is the amount that they paid and this is the current tax liability. So this is the amount that they paid to the government or actually owed the government. 220. Um, those two numbers are very, very different. And I would argue why they're different is they've worked out the expense, which let's say for argument's sake is 220, and then <coughs> over the top of that, they've laid in all these changes to DTLs and DTAs, which are the impacts that we're talking about just here. So there is a very legitimate reason why the amount of tax that you pay is different to the amount of tax that you expense. Um, but again, a lot of people won't look that far. And to then to start to explain them, oh, but look, there's these DTAs and the eyes glaze over and it's, it becomes too difficult. Even for a lot of accountants, it's not that straightforward what these things actually are. So you can understand it is a little bit confusing. Now, we're going to get into what they actually are in a moment, but it's good to note what they're not. So what a DTA isn't is, so if you see a company with a DTA, so it's an asset, it's not saying the government owes you money. So it's not that at this present point in time, if you know, your business falls over and your creditors are looking for you know, liquidating assets of the business, they can knock on the government store and say, hey, you owed this company money, they owed us money, you know, pony up. And on the same token, a DTL is not you owing the government money. A current tax liability is you owing the government money. A deferred tax liability is something different. Um, and that's what we have to have a look at. <coughs> And timing differences play a big part in this. So what we have here is an asset. I'm going to do a little bit of drawing because it's fun. Is it a requirement to recognize? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would, there may well be. Like, I can't speak to the to the European experience, but um. We have to, I mean, for, from an accounting point of view, that's, we are recognizing DTAs and DTLs. Yeah, that's, we, we're calculating, and as you'll see, we'll calculate all these numbers, and if there's a situation where we've got to recognize them, we do. There's a small caveat around DTAs, which we will get to, um, whether or not you do, but we do, generally speaking. Um, whether or not we should is a different question, but we'll talk about that towards the end. Right, that's a very badly drawn timeline, but it will work. One, two... Three, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Cool. Okay, let's start off with an asset. On the top side of this is accounting, and on the bottom side of this is tax. We bought this asset, let's say we purchased it for 80. So from an accounting point of view, we start with 80. <coughs> now it's depreciated over eight years, and let's assume a zero was zero residual. So we have $10 of depreciation expense each year, 10 years. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That will mean we have a carrying balance, carrying value at the end of zero. Nothing, com nothing complicated about that. That's just a normal depreciation situation with property, plant, and equipment. What we're going to be having to look at for tax is much the same thing happens, but we're doing it over four years, not eight years. So tax, we're going to get 20, and then 20, and 20, and then 20. But at that fourth year, we've depreciated out all the tax depreciation that we could. We started with, I should draw it in. We started with 80 here, and we've already depreciated out $80 worth of that asset. That asset is now worth nothing from a tax point of view. It's fully depreciated. We don't get any more deductions for it, which means the deductions here are zero. So what you can see from this is there are timing differences because the value of the asset here is 80 and the value here is 80. At time eight, it's zero. At time eight for, from a tax point of view, it's also worth zero. But let's look halfway. So at this point in time, the carrying value for accounting is going to be 40. So we've gone through halfway, we depreciated four years at 10, we've got a carrying value of 40. 
Now I'm going to, it's not called the carrying value, but I'll just call it sort of carrying value for tax purposes at the moment. But the carrying value for tax at time, at time four is going to be, is going to be zero. And that's the point. The timing di there are timing differences. These are different and these are different, but it ramps up. So if you think about the difference, there's more depreciation down here for these years and that difference is building. So it's 70, 60, 50, 40, but here it's 60, 40, 20. What's after 40? Anyway, that is increasing. But then as this is not getting depreciated anymore, but this one is, we're going to a difference of 30, 20, 10, and we're back down to zero. So those differences exist, but they're temporary. So from a balance sheet, when we're looking at deferred tax effects, we're looking at a balance sheet perspective. So the way that we go about doing this is basically take the balance sheet, all the assets and all the liabilities, and we get the accounting numbers for all of them. And most cases for these sort of questions, we'll just give you those numbers. It'll be like, here is you know, accounts receivable and cash and inventory and whatnot. And then what you guys need to do is work out, well, what is the tax base of those numbers? And what the tax base is, not how to actually calculate it, but what it is, is this here. So that's not actually called the carrying value. That's actually called the tax base. So the tax base is 80 and then it's zero and the tax base after one year is 60. So it's 60, then 40, then 20. So for tax purposes, we call it the tax base. So what we ultimately need to do is take the accounting number, take the tax base, and just simply take the difference between those two numbers. And then we multiply that difference by the tax rate. So if we look through what we have to do here, where is it? This is mechanical. Once we've got the carrying amount in the tax base, it's simply just taking the difference. So that's really easy. You're going to have the tax rate. Generally speaking, that's 30%. So that's mechanical. What isn't, and actually you'll come up here, that's going to be a given. So what the problem that you need to solve in this topic, generally speaking, is going to be working out, one, what is the tax base? That's, that's a major issue that we need to deal with. And secondly, once you've figured out it's a DT something, is it a DTA or a DTL? So yes, there's a process and you need to remember to do those steps, but ultimately the two sort of judgments and the two things you need to be aware of to go through this are one, what is the tax base? And secondly, once you've got a temporary difference and multiplied it by the tax rate, is it a deferred tax asset or a deferred tax liability? So those are the two critical things that you need to work through. So right. Cool. What is the tax base? Um, now there's a way to think about these, and this is where it's going to be a little bit of kind of holding on for the ride here because some of it will kind of come, come through relatively easily. Some of it will be something that you just need to spend time with. Um, the tax base of how it's defined is all in your standards. So it's actually in there. So you don't have to actually remember what these things are. And the really neat thing about the standards, if you go to paragraph six and paragraph seven, they have examples. They've got five examples of here is a transaction or an account. The carrying value is this, and this is the tax base. So I mean, for most common transactions, you're actually gonna have it with you in the exam. If you're in practice and having to deal with this stuff, you're gonna have that stuff with you. So it's more just making sure when you see it, you understand what those examples are. That's what we need to be at. So the tax base of an item is the amount attributed to the asset or liability for tax purposes. Now that is basically the balance sheet for tax. So if you had to create a balance sheet for tax using tax rules, that's all that we're doing. So instead of calling it the carrying value, we're calling it the tax base. The difference between the tax base and the carrying amount is the temporary difference that we need to worry about. Right, into the heavy lifting. The tax base of an asset so we're just dealing with assets at this point in time. The tax base of an asset is the amount that will be deductible for tax purposes against any taxable economic benefits that will flow to an entity when it recovers the carrying amount. We'll talk about the second bit in a moment, but... All right. 
Um, quick question. Has anyone, you know, I'll take it, you know, most of you have been here, been at uni for at least a year. Does anyone get or claim anything for self-education expenses? Okay, so a few, which is good. Textbooks, for example, you claim. Does anyone have a textbook that you have with you right at the moment that I could just hold up for a second? <laughs> you got a computer. Does anyone have a textbook I could just use just as a prop? No, oh, that's all right. It doesn't matter if it's a county textbook or not. Okay, thank you. Is this the actual textbook or a reader? No, it is a textbook. See, that's, that's why you bring this. It's, ours is a condensed version as well. Let's see how big it is. Anyway. So, when you buy this, how, if you don't mind my asking, how much was this? That wasn't too bad. It was 80 maybe? I thought you said 8. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. 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 <laughs> yeah, and we make you buy two. Um, so, $80 book. So, on one hand, you pay $80 for this. Now, this provides you a real benefit, I hope, because you read it and it helps you get through. It has the tutorial questions. So okay, it has the tutorial questions. So it helps you in some respects. So you paid $80 and it gets you a real benefit, I hope. That's why you buy textbooks or hopefully look at them. You should be. Hopefully you've got a handbook and you've opened it and you've read it and looked at things. So there's a real benefit from that. But the other thing this is, is you spent $80 on an asset. And that $80 will be deductible. So you'll be able to put, let's say, you know, I don't know all the rules about self-education expenses because it's a long time since I've had to worry about it. But you get to put that through as a tax deduction. So this $80 also represents an $80 deduction at some point. I think. <laughs> let's, just, let's just work with that. All right, you didn't? You're not getting all the things which you can claim? Anyway. All right. So it represents an $80, thank you. It represents an $80 deduction. So when you have an asset you paid for, it doesn't, not every single case is going to represent a deduction, but for most cases you will have something which you will be able to claim a deduction for at some point. Some of those you might have claimed before you used it, some of those will happen later on. But the tax base of an asset is the amount that will be deductible for tax purposes. So, let's have a look at this piece of machinery. It's a different piece of machinery, but you paid $200,000 for it. So we have something that we use and will give us benefit because it's going to make stuff for us. And we have been able, and we have been able to, to write that off. So that $200,000 at time zero when we buy it represents something which is usable, but it also represents future tax deductions. Let's assume you can get all that $200,000 out. It has already been deducted, depreciated $20,000 for tax, which means we have $180,000 left to deduct. So if we think about it, we're kind of here. It costs us 200. We've already done 20, which means there is a future 180 of deductions left. So at this point in time, that's how much we're going to be able to get as deductions in the future. The tax base of an asset is the amount that will be deductible for tax purposes. That's what's getting picked up there. Now, if those benefits are not taxable, so there may be situations where you have an asset and the benefits that you get, you're not going to be taxed on those benefits. The tax base of an asset is equal to its carrying amount. So basically tax base is equal to carrying amount at that point. So we have $10,000 in accounts receivable. In this situation, the revenue in relation to those sales have already been included in profit and loss. Um, so it would be something like debit, account receivable, credit, revenue. And then when you collect on it, and this is the benefit. So you've got this account receivable set up. And when you collect on it, it's debit, cash, nearly got that wrong, credit, account receivable. When this point in time happens, and you collect on that account, you're not going to get taxed on collecting that cash in this situation because you got taxed when the sale got made. So in that case, the benefit is not taxable. The tax base is going to be the same as the carrying amount because that's just what paragraph seven, paragraph 7 tells you to do. So it's just the same number. So $10,000 as a benefit, the receiving of cash is not taxable. So we now flip it to the other side. 
And I'll just look at the first part of this first. So the tax base of a liability is its carrying amount. So this is important because this will actually make your life a lot easier when you're trying to figure out if this gives rise to a DTL or a DTA. So the starting point for a liability when you're working out its tax base, you start with the carrying amount and then you take stuff away from the carrying amount. So the carrying amount less anything that will be deductible for tax purposes. <coughs> now, you guys are all budding accountants. If someone comes up to you and says, and you've already sort of covered this material, if, if someone comes up to you and has an annual report and says they see a provision for long service leave in the accounts, and that provision for long service leave, leave is $50,000, and they go, look, you know, I've had a look at this for some reason, they've been snooping through an annual report, who knows why, and they come to you and say, well, I've seen this, what does it mean? Because we covered employee benefits a few weeks ago, you guys should know what is going on with it. So what does a provision for long service leave represent? Estimate. An estimate, but in real terms, what's actually going to happen? What is happening? What's going on? It's kind of like a liability down the track. Yeah, so it's, Possibly. well. It's going to come up at some point. Yeah, so we'll change. It's, so it's a, it's a future payment down, the, it's a payment down the track. So the liability is now, you currently obliged, and they've said, we think you're going to have some, well, the company is saying, because it's the company that's come up with the number says, we think there's going to be some future payment. That is pretty much what it is. There's a present liability. Well, there is a present obligation. It's a liability. It's an uncertain time in amount, but they've come up with estimates and said, this is the number. So the real thing that's going on is you have a provision and it's $50,000. Long service leave expenses are only a tax deduction when you pay them. So what does that future payment also represent? So we know that there's an expectation from the company that they're going to pay $50,000. What else is going to happen when they pay it? Deduction. You get a tax deduction. Absolutely. And that's all that it is. So the tax base is the carrying amount, which is the 50, less any amount that will be deductible, which is also 50, because you're going to get the deduction at that point in time. So 50 less a deductible of 50 gives you zero. So that's all that's happened in that case. Okay, so revenue received in advance, there's another, another angle to this. So in the case of revenue received in advance, the tax base of the resulting liability is its carrying amount, less any amount of revenue that will not be taxable in future periods. So we're starting at the carrying amount, less any amount of revenue that will not be taxable in future periods. So let's see where we go with this. So interest received in advance. So, debit, cash, credit, I'll just call it unearned service revenue because it's effectively the same. Okay, so to have, an ex to have an unearned service revenue on the books, so if that's actually sitting in as a liability account at the moment, that means this has happened, but this hasn't. So at this point we received cash We've had a liability recognize the unknown service revenue and the revenue is taxed on a cash basis. So even though there's no revenue item here, so this is cash and this is a liability, you're going to get taxed at this point in time, which means when this happened, you're not going to get taxed when you record the revenue. Now, as you're probably getting a sense, and it's, I think, a fair a fair point to make is that this is one of the one this is a topic where it, it does become quite detailed in what you need to know so you do need to be on song when you start to look at this you need to I would I know a lot of you are working but I would start looking at this earlier rather than later because if you kind of come back to this in about two weeks time and sort of sort of pick it up later on it's not going to give you enough time to really get on top of it. This is one where you do need to pick it up in the next couple of days, I would say, even the weekend, if you can. It's going to make it a lot easier to work with later on. So there's no tax at this point in time. So the tax base is a carrying amount of 10, less the 10, because it's not taxable in future periods, and we've dealt with unearned service revenue. Right. I do this a little... I, I mean, this is a little bit of a legacy slide, but it's... They do talk about it in the standard, and I actually don't like the way they talk about it in the standard, so I'll talk about what they do, and then I'll talk about, I think, a way which is much easier to deal with. 
they talk about temporary differences, which is the carrying, so we worked out the carrying value or that's been a given. We've worked out the tax base. Then we take just literally the difference between those. And that is a temporary difference. Now you have two types of temporary differences. You've got taxable and you've got deductible. Taxable sounds like what it does what it sounds like. There's an increase in tax payable in future years and you're gonna get a detail out of it. Deductible, just like what it sounds like, you're gonna get a decrease in tax payable in the future and it's generally gonna give rise to a DTA. Yes, the standard does talk about that and the textbook does as well. I think there's a much easier, and I'll do the shortcut way here today because I just find it much easier to deal with. And we'll start with this page, <clears throat> which is if you have an asset, you can remember all of this stuff that if you have a tax base and it's bigger than the carrying amount, it's a DTA or a DTL if you do this. If you're looking at assets, 95% of the time, if you have a temporary difference for an asset, it's not 100%, it's not foolproof. So you, you still need to be careful, but there is, a, there is also a way to check this. 95% of the time, if you have a temporary difference, it is going to be a DTL. Not 100%, but most of the time, if you have a difference between the tax base and the carrying value of an asset, that difference is a DTL. So machinery, we have a temporary difference of $10,000. So tax base is 180, carrying value 190. I like to do this as just the absolute value. I don't like working in you know, you know, negative numbers. So the absolute difference here is 10. So we have a temporary difference. Now that temporary difference, the tax base is less than the carrying amount. Therefore, it's gonna give rise to a DTL. And that 10, you multiply it by 30%, gives you three, which is what you need. Now, what that 3,000 is, is a level. It is not a change. It's not saying there's been a $3,000 expense necessarily this year. What it's saying is at, where can I draw a timeline? At the 30th of the 6th, at the end of the financial year, the DTL balance is $3,000. If we can't do this entry unless we know what this number is. So in this particular case, I've made the assumption that we started with zero. So we're going from zero to 3,000, which is just a credit, and then we're debiting tax expense. If this was another number, then you would just simply take whatever the change is. I'm sorry. Now this is where you can use it as a check for what you're doing here. Because, and I, look, I'm pretty sure I could be proven wrong at some point, but I haven't seen it yet, is a hundred percent of the time, if you have a deferred tax something for liabilities, it will give rise to a DTA. And the reason for that is, thinking back to what the definition of the tax base for a deferred tax liability is. It is a carrying amount less future deductible amounts. So you're starting from a point, which is the carrying amount. So you're starting from carrying amount and then you're deducting something from it. And I have not come across a situation where these future deductible amounts are negative. I just, I, look, it could well exist. I haven't seen everything in life, but I haven't seen it in this subject. So which means the carrying amount has to, by mechanical kind of calculations, the carrying amount has to be greater. So the tax base of a liability, from what I've seen and from this subject, and if you come across a situation where it's not, please let me know, but it'll be a DTA. Which means it's really handy. You know which way the sign works for liability because you know that's got to be DTA and then you just reverse it for, for assets and just flick it around and it'll work that way. So we have a long service leave liability of 50,000. The tax base is zero. That's really straightforward. So we've got $50,000 times by 30% gives you 15,000. And... And what you have to do, and we're going to do this later on, is 
joyful as this sounds. What we have to do and what you have to be able to do is take a balance sheet and do that for each and every asset and liability. That's what we have to do. Now, kind of... We will, but that doesn't, that's not, profit and loss statement has nothing to do with deferred taxes. Okay, well, it has an indirect effect, but we'll look at that. But in terms of the actual calculation of the deferred taxes, we don't touch the profit and loss statement. It is literally, here is the balance sheet, and just work out the tax base. But we're going to go through that example, so kind of hold your fire. But in relation to your earlier comment about recognizing DTAs and DTLs, you can only recognize a DTA if you're going to make, if you expect to make future taxable profit. So the carrying amount of deferred tax asset shall be reviewed at each reporting date and an entity shall reduce the carrying amount of a deferred tax asset to the extent that it is no longer probable that sufficient taxable profit will be available. So if you want a red flag on a company, and I've never heard of a company doing this, but you know, again, could well have happened. And I'm sure if they've gone down this track, then other things would have been going very, very wrong for them. But if you see a company impairing its deferred tax assets, that's basically saying that company doesn't think it's going to make taxable profits at all. It just doesn't think it's going to make profits into the future. Now, if you have a company saying that we don't think we're going to make profits into the future, it's probably not a good sign. So if you see that happen, there's an issue. Um, so that's about the only time where DTLs, absolutely, DTAs, only recognize to the extent that we can actually have profits to offset them against. Which brings us into a company. For the day lecture, probably less so, although, I don't know. I've certainly been to this company and used this company far too many times. Some of you may have used this company and been, been to this particular store. Um, it's one in which, yeah, I've been there. So we went, we basically furnished our place in London with Ikea. Um, and we actually, we just caught, we didn't have a car over there, so we just caught public transport out there and it was a long way away and it was cold. And, and then we didn't get all the stuff. We got it back and we realized we needed more stuff and we had to go out again. And then for Evie's bed, you know how sometimes, if you've been to Ikea, some things aren't always just in one like, box. You have to get like two or three boxes for a particular item. So we got the one box for her bed, but didn't realize the slats were in a separate box. So it's all well and good to have a bed frame, but if you don't have, in, the mattress doesn't go anywhere. So I was tasked to go out alone to sort that out, which was <coughs> really fun. That said, dollar hot dogs. <laughs> okay, not pound hot dogs over there, but dollar hot dogs. You try less to think about what's actually in them, but they're cheap. The reason I bring this up is there's actually been, and I'll put the articles up on this um, over the next day or two. Some of you may be aware of this, some of you may not, but there's been some stories about how much tax they do or don't pay, because this is a nice story about some of the goings on with companies. So we have a Ki IKEA Proprietary Limited, which is the Australian store that we deal with. Now their profit, maybe not the best of color schemes, but their profit or their revenue in 2011 was $556 million. Their profit before tax was 9.5. Now, to me, and I don't know the furniture industry all that well, but to me, that seems like a really low profit margin. And they paid about $2.5 million in tax, which $2.5 million or 9.5 looks about 30%, so they seem to pay the right amount of tax on their profit, but the profit seemed really low, so something's going on there. These guys are part of a group um, owned by Inca, 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 holding BV. Now in 2011, their revenue was close to $33 billion and their net profit after tax, so that's even after tax, so it's not even before tax, their net profit after tax was $3.8 billion. So a smidgen over 10% as a profit margin, which again, you don't need a calculator, but that seems to be bigger than that number as a percentage. Something's going on. And it gets even better because ultimately, Inca holding BV is owned by Stichting Inca <laughs> Foundation. Now, if something has foundation in the word, what does that tend to suggest that it is? Charity. Yes, it is. <coughs> Ultimately, IKEA is owned by a charity. Why do you think they'd want to be owned by a charity? Yeah, tax is kind of something they don't really have to pay an awful lot of. So ultimately, the profits 
that this company made down here are repatriated up through the layers up to the very, the very top, which is a charity. And they don't pay an awful lot of tax. That said, even European tax rates are less than what Australian tax rates are. So even without the charity aspect, there is definitely benefit for them to do that. So when you go off and buy your Billy bookcase and whatever else the hell you need to buy from these, well, those cube units, the cube units seem to be everywhere. Um, when you go and buy those cube units, generally speaking, the markup that IKEA here is paying to wherever they're buying them from, which is also part of the chain, is not, you know, that markup is massive. So they're taking a really small percentage cut here because they're trying to reduce the amount of tax that they pay in this country and pushes it on somewhere else. Um, <clears throat> even that is not the limit of what they do. Now, again, I'll put up some articles about it, but these guys actually pay, they're not licensing fees, but they pay you know, multi-million multi dollar fees up the chain for, it's not licensing, but just other random fees, which again are an inter-company inter transaction and they can pretty much set that or whatever they want to set it up. Now, from an accounting perspective, from a group perspective, that gets eliminated. But from a tax perspective, that doesn't. And so we have to deal with that and get really small amounts of, pro of tax from them. Again, is it a really smart thing to do? I mean, obviously, you know, if they're doing it for their shareholders or sick kids or whoever they're helping, I don't know, um, that could well be. But again, they're not paying arguably the tax that they should be paying. And is that something that somehow we need to be dealing with that? But how do we do that? I don't know. On that cheery note, I'm going to leave, I'm going to just take a break for a couple of minutes and then we'll get back into and work through that main practical example um, to really see how all this fits together. What we're going to start having a look at is putting some numbers. Well, we've already put some numbers to it. Let's put some more numbers and take quite a big question and break it down into what you need to do. Um, odds on, you're not going to get a big question like this as one whole hit in an exam. It may be just do the current tax bit. It may be just do the deferred tax bit. It may be do parts of the deferred tax bit. So it just depends on what mood I was in when I wrote it and how, you know, how nasty I was feeling. But when we see some final exams, some past final exams, which will be released this week sometime, you'll get a sense of the types of questions that we ask, or we have asked. So in setting this up, the way that this is going to run for us is you start with, to calculate taxable income, this is the amount of money. Um, this is what you sort of lodge with the ATO. Now, yes, it's technically taxable income under Australian tax law, but they do talk about it as taxable profit in the standards, and that's because the standards are global, so they've used a more generic taxable profit. The whole point of this exercise is to get from an accounting profit, so generally net profit before tax, made up with all the revenues and expenses and accounting judgments that have to be made to get that number, and then get from this number down to taxable profit. And that means looking at things which are in the accounting but aren't allowed for tax. So you may have some sort of expense which is an accounting expense but you don't get the tax deduction that particular year. So long service leave for example. UTS will be showing a very small tax, expense, uh, very small long service leave expense for me each year but there is no tax deduction for me. So you, they will be adding back, you know, if we're going through this process, you'll be adding back that long service leave expense. And then you're looking at the tax side of things and then you'll be deducting whatever was paid in long service leave. So you just look at literally how much was going out. And we do the similar thing with revenue. So look at revenues which are included in profit but not accessible for tax. So it might be unearned service revenue which you've now performed the service but you got you got the tax or you got deducted not deducted you got assessed for tax on it when you received the cash so that would that revenue would be taken out and then you'd add back any and you include any revenue in there for cash payments up front in the, for un, for other unknown service revenue so it's just looking at differential effects once you've got that number this is fairly straightforward. A thousand times thirty percent gives you not that number. That's a bit 
Why can I not calculate that? Long day. $300. That's right, isn't it? It is. Anyway, so $300. And you'd recognize that as tax expense. The critical things to put in here, where, you know, with a lot of our entries, we're fairly agnostic on a few things, but you need a debit, you need a credit. Um, tax expense, tax and expense. If you want to throw in other things that make sense, feel free. Um, but as long as you've got something like debit tax expense, we're happy with that. And for the tax liability, as long as you've got credit, current is probably good for this because deferred tax liabilities are different. So current tax liability. So income you probably don't need, but if you want to include it, feel free. Um, and measured using the tax rates enacted or substanti substantively enacted at that point. 30% um, is what we're using. So this is part of the first page that you have of the demonstration. Now, this is <clears throat> what you see in the right-hand column, you would not get as information. Because if you got that as information, then we've already given you the answer. So those first two columns, this you could get as part of a question. So we've just literally got the accounting profit before tax. And we've got various expenses. In this case, we're assuming all the revenues, the tax and accounting effects of revenues are the same. We're focusing on expenses in this one. So we've got a whole bunch of accounting expenses. I should make that clear. And we've got accounting profit. <coughs> we then have, we're going to ignore the statement of financial position for this section. We don't need it for this section. We're going to flip the page. And here's some other information about the various expenses. And I, I realize again that it's small, but you have the write up with you. The admin and salary expenses were paid in the same year that they were incurred. So those will be treated, there's no difference in timing. The long service leave, none of it has been paid and it's not deductible until it is. Warranty expenses were accrued and at year end actual payments of $10,000 have been made. Insurance was initially prepaid to the amount of 40. Actual payments are allowed as a tax deduction. Sales, a tax at the time the sale is made. The plant is depreciated over five years for accounting purposes, but over four years for taxation purposes. Now, just to draw your attention to, so this ad, admin and salary expenses, there's kind of no difference that are going on here. So we know from the outset we can ignore this. <coughs> what we're looking at for these ones are when they get paid. So none has been paid, not deductible until paid. Warranty expenses are accrued, actual payments had been made, insurance was initially prepaid to the amount of 40, um, and then we've got depreciation, which we'll come to. Now, the way I'd set this up is on page, on lower down on page two. Now, there's a couple of comments I want to make about this, because this is not, you don't have to go this particular format to do this. If there's a way that you're happy to do and you're getting the right answer each time, absolutely feel free to use it. But the things I would suggest, and there's two points that are really important here that I really suggest that you do. Is to put in two lines for each expense. So if you know there's a difference between warranty expense and long, and so warranty expenses and how they get treated, put in an add back for the warranty expense and then put in a deduct for the warranty deduction make sure you have two lines for each because that way you won't miss it. So if we can see that's happened here. If we draw it up, that block, that's all the accounting effects. And then we have the tax effects. So if we look at say long service leave, we add back an expense and I've included, and I did this specifically, even though that amount is zero and it had actually worked just the same if we excluded that line, I've put it in because it makes sure that you don't forget to add something. So if you've got one, make sure you put in the other side of it. Um, the second thing I'm going to do, and it's related to this, is don't aggregate the effects. So for example, warranty expenses, add 45, take away 10, Mechanically, it's just the same if you just have warrant, net warranty effect to add 35. 
it's going to give you the same answer. But I think just from a just from a working point of view, I think it's safer to do it, especially in an exam, is to make sure you do both because one, it means you're less likely to make an error when you're actually doing it because you'll see both this and that effect. Secondly, if we're looking at what you're doing, then we can see what you've done much more easily than if you've sort of aggregated it somewhere else and then put in the net effect here. Um, so as lastly as well, if you're running through your exam and reviewing it as you're going through and sort of running out of time and then it's hard for you to pick up what you've actually done, if you lay it out nice and simply, you can see exactly what's happened. Um, so two lines for each expense, don't aggregate effects. So we've got the accounting effects that we're adding back all the expenses and we've got the tax effects and we're taking away all those tax deductions. Now with these numbers, I won't flip back, but if you look at the profit and loss statement, they're including the net profit, I suppose, but these four items, they're all from the profit and loss statement. It's literally just going, take it, take it, take it, take it, and just throw them in. With these ones, apart from depreciation, look at how much you paid during the year is, how, is what's driving these. So long service leave paid, there was none. That's why it's zero. Warranties paid, it tells you there was 10,000 paid. That's put in because that's a deduction. Tax depreciation, that one is obviously different and that's the 600,000, which is the cost of the asset and you can find that on the, on the balance sheet, divided by four gives you 150. So you can see that too. And insurance paid, you told that insurance was prepaid to 40,000. So it's, again, it's just what you paid. Nothing more, nothing less. <coughs> so we just start with here. So we start, add these, take away these, and we end up with 465,000. Multiply that by the tax rate, and that'll give you 139,500. And then simply debit tax expense, credit tax payable, 139,500, and you've got that sorted out. Um, so that is the first stage of working through one of these like, combined problems is the current tax aspect of it. Let's get into the harder stuff. The order of it? Like in the order I put it there? Um, no, it's not. I mean, like ultimately, so the question was just for those who couldn't hear it, does it matter about the order? At the end of the day, what matters is, if I can get to it. At the end of the day, what matters is you start at this point and you end at that point. What order you put them in, even what I've talked about here, that's just my suggestion for a good way to do it. Like, I, you don't have to do it that way. You could aggregate them and it would all work out. Um, but ultimately, you need to get, in this case, from 435 down to 465. Um, I think, I'll just have a look at the question. And I think the reason I chose the order that I chose is if you look at page one, that is just the order which those expenses turn up. So I've just gone warranty, long service leave expenses, warranty expenses, depreciation insurance. I've just followed the method, the, the order that I had there. Doesn't mean you can't choose a different one. So just whatever gets you that 465, just, just, just use that. <laughs> now, <clears throat> I'm actually going to flip through these, sli these slides very quickly because I... Even though they're technically correct and they do the right things, I still think they probably do them in an order and in a way which I'm not... I think it's a little bit of a long way around. So then you can look at, okay, step two, recognize the tax expenses relating to increases in taxable temporary differences. I'll, I'll, I won't talk about the entries for a second. We'll come back to all of that. Then step three, recognize the tax expense relating to increases in, de in deductible. So we've got increases in taxable, increases in deductible. Then steps four and five is just doing the reverse of that, the decreases in both of those items. And I think that is, from a step point of view, a very long way of doing that. I think there's a much easier way, which is what we're going to have a look at. 
Um, so the first thing is, assuming we get to DTAs and DTLs, what we're talking about possible to combine entries, this is not setting off. This is something different, and we'll talk about set off in a bit. When we're talking about combining, what I'm talking about is, say for example, we have debit DTA 10, credit tax expense 10, debit uh, tax expense 7, credit DTL 7. You can have that, or what is equally acceptable And what do we need? We need a credit. I think that's right. So we still have the same total DTA, we still have the same total DTL, and when you add these together, we still have the same credit, like the overall credit tax expense. So we haven't actually changed how the statements look, it's just saving you a line of writing stuff out. If you want to do one, you want to do the other, that's all fine, happy, to, happy for you to do that. What we're talking about with offsetting is different. So with DTLs and DTLs combining, we're talking about keeping the actual value of the DTA entry and the value of the DTL entry and keeping those numbers there. Taking that example across to the next page, so using these numbers, what we're talking about offsetting is what would look like this. Okay, is debit DTA 3, credit tax expense 3. The total amount of tax expense is the same, but instead of showing the DTA and the DTL, we're just showing the net impact of them. Now, the reason, the limited circumstances in which you can use them are worth having a look at, but generally what we're talking about is when the tax authority that you're dealing with for all of this stuff is the same. So if we're solely based in Australia and the company is solely dealing with the ATO, then you can do that. So we're going to assume that that is the case with the examples that we use. So you are allowed to do this instead of showing these. So any of these are equally acceptable for in terms of presentation purposes. Um, that slide, I've got that around the wrong way, but that's okay. We'll have a look at the statement of financial position. So this is getting into the deferred section. Now the shortcut way to do this, we've got assets, we've got liabilities. I'm gonna start with liabilities first, it makes life a lot easier. Um, I'll start with provisions because they're ones we've already talked about. So the provisions with liabilities, I'll just read out the definition again because it's useful to do it while we're doing this section. So the definition of a liability specifically is the tax base of a liability, which is what we're looking at down the bottom, the tax base of a liability is its carrying amount less any amount that will be deductible for tax purposes in respect to that liability in future periods. Provision for warranty expense. We've got this provision sitting here, so that's saying we're going to have deductions of $35,000 in the future. So carrying value less future deductible gives you zero. Provision for long service leave expense. 30 less 30 gives you zero. We have, you know, mechanically that just works out. Bang, bang. Now, if you think about the information that's given, what you would be given in an exam are these first two columns. This carrying value information is given. This information here is not. This is what you need to do. Temporary differences is easy. Temporary difference is just literally carrying value minus a tax base. So as long as you get this sorted out, that is just literally taking stuff away from stuff, which you guys all have calculators, easy. <coughs> now with, I'll talk about loan payable, but accounts payable kind of works the same, but let's talk about loans payable. So the tax base of a liability is a carrying amount less any amount that will be deductible for future periods. So. I need someone to loan me some money. Can you loan me some money? So what's your name? Anthony. Anthony. So Anthony loans, loans me $300,000. Okay. 
because you know, he's got good shoes. He obviously has $300,000 just sitting around. When I pay Anthony back his $300,000, now it's not the interest. We're not talking about, you know, the, although you could be a nice guy and do it interest free and I just maybe use it for whatever I want to use it for. I give you back your $300,000. We don't necessarily know the tax laws. I certainly you know, don't know it in detail. It's a long time since I've done the detail of that subject. Do you think I can get a tax deduction when I give him back the money that he gave me as a loan? No, nah, it doesn't make a lot of sense because otherwise I could just borrow money from everyone, re repay it quickly, borrow it from somewhere else and I'd have tax deductions coming out of everywhere. So when I just simply give him the principal back, I'm not getting a tax deduction for that. So if you think about the tax base of a liability is the carrying amount, the 300, less amounts deductible for tax purposes, I'm not getting a deduction when I give you that money back. So there is nothing, where is it? It's 300 minus zero, because I'm not getting a deduction in that case. And the same idea will hold up here. So in, the, in these cases, the tax base is the same, so you get zero differences. Um, bless you. Before moving on, it's actually really easy at this point to figure out what these will give rise to. Um, because a liability, if there is a temporary difference, we haven't done the calculation by the tax rate yet, but we're talking about a situation where we will end up with a DTA. That is not the DTA, but these temporary differences will give rise to DTAs. Now we take it up to assets. So an asset, the tax base of an asset is the amount that will be deductible for tax purposes against any taxable, any taxable economic benefits that will flow to an entity whenever it recovers the carrying amount of that asset. So for cash, and you'll get used to a few of these, cash and inventory are two which are pretty commonly not different. So cash, you're sitting there, it's not really doing anything. So Yes, you're going to get potentially deductions and sort of issues in relation to the interest in relation to cash, but the actual cash itself, that's not, there's no real deduction, there's no taxable impact of that, it just is. So that cash, the tax base, these are going to be the same. Inventory is much the same here. Accounts receivable, the actual account receivable is the same. But what is not in this example, but where you need to pay attention is if there is an allowance for doubtful debts. So in this case, there's no allowance. But if there is, you need to pay attention to what happens there. This is the same with inventory. With? Inventory. Provision for inventory. Provision for sort of, obviously. Yeah. It would. I mean, if there are provisions or allowances of things, those things will get treated differently for, I can't think of an example where we've done something with an inventory, a contra for entry, if for inventory. Mm -hmm. But you will see allowance of doubtful debts in this subject. So it's just, if it's something which is likely dealt with differently for tax and accounting, because I can't see if you've got a provision or some sort of allowance for inventory, it's not going to be a tax effect, at, a tax deduction at that point. Yeah. I can't hear you. Um, prepaid insurance. So prepaid insurance, if we have a look at it, um, tax base of an asset is the amount that will be deductible for tax purposes against any taxable benefits. The prepaid insurance, when do we get the tax deduction for insurance for this question. Yeah, when you pay it. So you've already got the deduction for this particular 5,000. You'd use up 35, you paid 40, you'd use up 35, which means you've already got the deduction for this, which means there are no future deductions left. You've already had the benefit. So that's been already deducted, so that gives you zero. The plant, the cost of the plant doesn't change. What we're dealing with is the accumulated depreciation. And I think we're all pretty comfortable at this point how we've, we've dealt with a few property, plant and equipment examples. But we've got 120 versus 150 because this is over four years, not six. So we end up with 150,000, giving you a net of 480 versus 450. Temporary differences. And then it's just simply figuring them out. Zero, zero, zero. We've got a $5,000 difference here. We don't worry about that item or that item, but we're worried about the net, and that's a $30,000 difference. So again, the first stage, and we think back to earlier on, the steps that you need to go through. This information is a given. 
It's just calculating these numbers out. Once you've got this, those numbers are easy because they're simply the difference between them. So you can imagine from a marking point of view what we're looking at. Temporary differences, we're going to assume that if you worked out a tax base, you're going to get the temporary differences correct because you, know, you, you should. What is then a thing that we need to deal with is what do these give rise to? Are they DTAs or DTLs? Now, these will give rise to DTAs. It just has to be. And so if you forget what you have to do, just remember these are DTAs. That provision, the carrying value is greater than the tax base. Carrying value greater than the tax base. So it's the signs are this way. Let's have a look at these ones. Carrying value is greater than the tax base. So it's like that. And the carrying value is greater than the tax base. So these signs are all in the same direction. Now, because these are liabilities, these will end up as DTAs. And because these are assets, they have to be the opposite of what's happened here because they're all in the same. So these are going to give rise to DTL effects. So we will add these two together, which is 35,000. And if you wanted to have more columns and do it as a column point of view, you can do that. Um, so we have 35,000. There's my pointer. There it is. Times 30%. Bless you, I think. I don't know. I didn't, didn't see who that was. 35,000 times 30%. Is that a hiccup or a... <laughs> just let it out. Just, just be done with it. Um, 35,000... Now we're just all waiting for the next one. Not to put you under too much pressure. 35,000 times 30%, which someone has, is 10,500. And that's going to be a 10,500 DTL. We've got a DTA, which is being based on these two figures, which is 65,000 times by 30%, gives you 19,500. Um, again, you can set this out differently. You can roll them along and have another couple of columns if you want, but it really is up to you how you deal with it. Um, now, the important thing is, for this, when you work out these numbers, that's not the change. That is the level at that point in time. What you then need to have a look back is, well, what was the opening balance for a DTA in the DTL? And if you look down, there are no DTAs and no DTLs, which means that is also the change. So when it comes to the entry, the DTA is just debit 19,500. The DTL is 10,500. And because I've combined these, credit income tax expense, 9,000. Alternatively, if you want to set them off, you can do something like this. You know? So either would be acceptable in this case. And that's working through the current tax effects, and that's working through the deferred tax effects. And we have a couple of things. We talked about tax rate changes. It is worthwhile bringing that up. So there's a, couple of, there's a couple of things we need to talk about quickly. Um, now, I granted, I realize it is late in the evening, and <coughs> we have talked about a lot. And some, we won't go through this in a huge amount of detail, but it is something you need to be aware of. And once you've got your head around the rest of this stuff, these things are actually relatively straightforward. So tax rate changes. When the tax rate changes, that affects the DTA and DTL. Because imagine we have a DTA in our books, and that DTA is, I'm going to pick a better number than I did this morning, 300. So if you've got a DTA, and that is in your balance sheet, and you see it at 300, that, and we're using a 30% tax rate, that means the temporary difference which this DTA was created on is thousand dollars. So that's actually the, the temporary difference which underlies that DTA. If the tax rate changes and comes down to 28.5%, that means the new DTA should in fact be $285.
So it's not that the temporary difference has changed, it's just the rate that you're using has changed. And that means you need to have a drop. You need to reflect that drop, and I'll leave it to you guys to figure out what you think you should do with that. You have a drop in the DTA of $15. So that will come down, and then you do whatever effects you need to do with. But that's the first thing that you do. And if you've got DTLs, you'll do just the same thing. So that's the tax rate change, so you need to pick up that difference. Tax losses. In a way, we talked about this a little bit before. Um, if you run a business, and this isn't negative gearing. Negative gearing is stuff where you're allowed to offset losses against other parts of your business, uh, other, against your personal income. But for tax losses, so imagine you start up a business and it you know, makes profits. The entries that you're going to see happen are, for profit making, is you're going to have a tax expense and then you're going to credit, ultimately, cash. They'll say, this is how much tax you owe us, and you're going to ultimately pay them. If you are making losses, credit tax expense, it's not the reverse. You don't make a tax loss and they go, here, have some money. That doesn't happen. What happens is they'll set it up as a DTA to begin with. And then when you start to make some money, hopefully that will happen, then you get to reflect a lower amount of cash being paid. So for example, let's put some numbers against this. So let's say this was 100 and 100. So debit DTA, we had 100 set up and credit tax expense. Now, next year, we've actually made a fair bit of money, well, more than what we lost, $150,000 tax expense. We, instead of having to pay cash of $150 at that point in time, we would just knock off the 100 for the DTA, which we set up here, and then that will be the ultimate amount of cash that we pay out. So instead of going debit cash 100 effectively and then credit cash 150, which still ends up as credit cash 50. So instead of doing that at time zero and then time one, we're going zero cash there and then credit cash 50 down here. So it's the same total amount of cash which has gone out, you're just only getting a deduction in the amount you pay rather than the government actually giving you money. Um, and again, you've got, to be assu you've got to be assuming that you're actually going to make money into the future. Unless, that, unless you do that, you can't recognize that DTA. The very final thing, and then I've got a couple of quick comments on admin and we shall call it a night. Asset revaluations, week four, week three, week three. Debit asset credit revaluation surplus. The ultimate idea of this, and if you're doing ABC, you've already dealt with this ad nauseum, but when you make the revaluation, the tax base isn't revalued. That's ultimately what's happening. Guys, you looking? <coughs> Jordan, <laughs> come on guys. So the tax base doesn't change. The, the, the ATO will not revalue your tax base up. So the tax base stays still, but if you're revaluing your asset up, suddenly you've got this bigger difference occurring. And what ultimately happens is you're going to see that play out with a deferred tax liability. Like you can have this deferred tax liability set up because implicit in that is if you've revalued it up, you've revalued it up to fair value, which is basically saying, if we sold this now, this is what we could get for it. But you haven't actually sold it. So you kind of know when you sell it, you're gonna be making more on it than what it currently is in your books. So it's almost like here is the profit that we're gonna make on this asset. And on that profit, so we could make, we've revalued it up by $20,000. That's saying we're gonna make a $20,000 profit on it. In a sense, if we sold it now, we would make a $20,000 profit. And if we make that profit, we're going to pay more tax to the tune of, in this case, $6,000. But what we're doing is saying, well, that hasn't happened yet, but we, we're expecting it will happen. So we credit a, a DTL to reflect that when we finally sell it, we're going to be making a profit on it, and that will actually sort of come out in terms of um, you know, more tax that we're paying at that point in time. 
So that's why we have a DTL, which is late in the evening to be soaking all that up, but hopefully that made sense. Very last thing, this is sort of philosophical in a way. Is there an asset? Well, it's in the books as an asset. Well, it must be an asset. But you control it, sure. Well, I don't know. I mean, you have a DTA. Do you, is it a resource you could sell? No. If the government decides to change the tax rates, that's going to change the value of it. So whether or not you get a benefit from it is contingent upon you making money in the future. So whether or not it actually fits the framework definition of an asset is actually questionable. And a lot of analysts will actually, if they see a large DTA in the books of a company, will actually not include them in terms of the structure of how they value that company. So there are arguments to say, yes, we do these things and there is a reason we do them, but no one actually uses them. They don't go, we can't sell them off, we can't do anything. They're not really a value of the company. And the similar point of view with DTLs, is there really a liability? It's not like the ATO have handed you a statement saying you owe us X amount of money. What it's saying is you think sometime in the future you're going to owe the ATO some money. So there is no present liability at this point in time. So there are questions about whether or not the DTLs and DTAs are actually liabilities and assets. Um, I think it adds a lot of complexity to what we've got to do. Because I mean, because of this standard, we've got to do all this stuff and that's been done in every company that needs to report this way. And that's not an easy thing to do. Do people even understand what the hell is going on with them? You know, I've been teaching this for a while and I still don't really pay much attention to DTAs and DTLs. And it's one where I don't know necessarily if it adds that much value to what's going on. Is that a question or is this a, no. Um, you know, I don't know if it really does that much, and it just makes things a lot more complex. But we've got to do it, so we have done it. And the summary of today, and then we'll talk a little bit about admin, and then we'll finish things up. So tax payable versus tax effect, balance sheet approach we had a look at. We worked through a calculation of current tax and deferred taxes, thought about tax rate changes, deferred tax, uh, tax losses, and revaluations. And that's tax.